Author John Nichols takes us on a tour of writing the Milagro Beanfield War. I wrote Milagro basically to try and address all the social injustice, the cultural injustice, the economic injustice, the environmental injustice. That is essentially destroying the planet. I mean, I, I thought of the book as a universal statement. I woke up this morning, I don't know what to do. Developers want my water and I'm feeling mighty blue. I've got those Milagro, those terrible Milagro blues. First published in 1974, the book is on its 18th printing, been translated into nine languages, and made into a feature film for which he co-wrote the screenplay. Of course, the final consensus of opinion arrived at by both those who were for Joe Mondragon and those who were against him was that in order for him to do what he did and thus precipitate the war that was bound to follow, Joe had to be crazy. People also figured only a miracle could save Joe from his foolhardy suicidal gesture. Yet Milagro was a town whose citizens had a pension for not only going crazy, but also for precipitating miracles. Most of the characters in the Milagro Beanfield were our archetypes. And you can find these archetypes everywhere. I would hope that people reading this book in France could identify with it, that people reading this book in, in, um, in Nicaragua could identify with it. In every story, you got the good apples, you got the bad apples. In the Milagro Beanfield War, there's a struggle between the good apples and the bad apples. Good apples in Milagro managed to defeat all the bad apples, and it's as simple as that. Mucho frijoles, maíz también, tomates y chile verde son nuestra salvación. Posa la chingada, amigos con los Milagro Blues. If you're going to write about cultural genocide, if you're going to write about the kind of development and economic system that destroys a wide range of the population that's lived here for 400 years, right? See if you can make it somehow humorous enough that people will actually read it. About 15 and a half minutes after Joe Mondragon first diverted water from Indian Creek into his parents' old bean field, most of Milagro knew what he'd done. 15 and a half minutes being as long as it took immortal 93-year-old Amarante Cordova to travel from a point on the Milagro Garcia highway spur next to Joe's outlaw bean field to the frontier bar across the highway, catty corner to Rael's general store. The Milagro Beanfield War is about a little struggle over water in a taxation district to um, exploit the water, right, in northern New Mexico. It's basically infinity in a grain of sand. It's a struggle for how the town will develop or will it not develop. It's a struggle for will a sustainable agricultural economy survive in the area, or will it become various corporations that will then get all the water? Most people strive mightily to survive. And it's really important, you know, to give the message that even though doom is ultimately our lot, that life is really worth living and really fun to live. Obviously, the Milagro Beanfield War tries to give that message at the same time that it tries to give an important message about, you know, what's right and what's wrong. These are the scales of justice, right? And when I write, I want to make sure 
that the scales of justice on the correct historical side are much heavier than the scales of justice on the wrong historical side. New Mexico is a part of the whole. When we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Great art can take a bite out of the bad apple. <laughs> And Pacheco, asleep, laboring for his life, breathing stertorously dream. It was five o'clock on a summer evening. Bees simmered a lush apricot spoon weighted the air. His wife was playing the piano, Chopin, a prelude. Men irrigating in the silver fields paused, leaning contemplatively on their shovel handles to listen. A sheep bell clanked, animals lazing home. Dust, stirred up by the day's traffic on the roads, hung softly, a beige mist across the fields. Melvin, who died later on in Korea, caressed the slow August landscape chasing butterflies. The laughter of children a half mile away carried clearly across the fields, somehow releasing memories of making love early on a frosty autumn morning when people could hear the ax blows of their neighbors chopping wood all across the small valley. Then death, decked out in a sombrero, a serape, and shiny silver spurs, a spicy carnival apparition dancing over the little village, chuckled like a dove, winked in a joking, comradely fashion at Pacheco, and jitterbug quietly on into the resplendent and remarkably spangled horizon.